안녕하십니까 한국어. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. This is Yang Sung Hae, head of journalism support team at Korea Press Foundation. From now on, we'll start the third KPF EWC forum, jointly hosted by KPF and the East Best Center. Today's theme is New U.S. Administration and its policy toward Korea-U.S. relations in North Korea. Today's forum is being held in a virtual manner connecting Seoul, Hawaii, and Washington, D.C. It is also being broadcast live through KPF's YouTube channel in Korean and English with the help of simultaneous interpretation. If you're watching us through YouTube, you can choose your preferred language between Korean and English, and those who are with us in the meeting room can use the interpretation device on the table if needed. Channel 1 is Korean and channel 2 is English. Um, please wear your masks always in the meeting room. 
and the moderator and the all, all the speakers and panelists, you can take off your mask when speaking, making your comments if it's uncomfortable, but else you have to always wear your mask. And from now, Mr. Pyo Wan Su, chairman of Korea Press Foundation, will deliver his re welcoming remarks. I'll take off my masks. Good day. I'm Pyo Wan Su, Chairman of Korea Press Foundation. I'm very honored to host the third Joint Journalism Forum, and I'm very thankful and happy for this. Uh, since the inauguration of the Biden administration, this is the first forum that we're having and the theme is about the Biden administration and the policy toward U.S.-Korea relations and the North Korea policy. So we think that we can see the we can see our seeing high hope on the U.S.-Korea relations and also the relations with North Korea. So all the speakers and the panelists and the audience who are listening to the forum online and offline, I think we are all sharing the same thought. So thank you for uh, co-hosting this event, uh, the East West Center. Especially thank you, uh, Chief Executive uh, Mr. Richard Bostecki, and the speakers, Mr. Mark Knapper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, and Ms. Jenny Town, uh, Director of Stimson, Stimson Center's 38 North, and Mr. Ko Yun Ju, Director General for North Korean Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Mr. Hong Min, Director of North Korean Korea Research, oh, North Korean Research Division at the Korea Institute for National University. Thank you very much. And the Korean American journalists who gladly agreed to participate as discussants, thank you very much. Uh, Korea Press Foundation and the East West Center uh, held two uh, virtual forums on the coronavirus and false information and the situation on the Korean Peninsula last year. At that time, the forums were evaluated as an exemplary case for overcoming a world isolated or cut off by the coronavirus and continuing international exchanges. Today's forum is the third virtual meeting jointly held by KPF and EWC. So in today's forum, we will discuss a good prospects on the U.S.-Korea relations and the policy toward North Korea. Uh, so I hope we will have in-depth and meaningful discussions on the issues, so that the media and the people of two country of the two countries will be able to broaden their understanding of each other. Lastly. I would like to once again thank those who have come to this event in person and who are watching live on YouTube. Going forward, Korea Press Foundation will continue to create and invite you to a public forum to discuss important issues regarding domestic affairs and international affairs in our society. Thank you. Chief Executive of the East West Center. And uh, regretting the fact that the pandemic uh, per, uh, forbids us from being together face to face. But we're still face to face on screen, which is not a, too bad a fallback. And it's very happy uh, for us, I think, to all to be together. I want to extend a sincere thank you to our co-host, our distinguished speakers and discussants, and to all the viewers joining us here today on this Zoom-enabled event. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here in this third of a series, which I think we'll find very valuable indeed. I want to extend a, a special welcome and sincere congratulations from the East-West Center to the new chairman of the Korean Press Foundation, Chairman Pew won Su, who took over his position last October and will be serving a three-year term, and we're very much looking forward to working closely with him and his college. 
as colleagues at, at, the found, at the foundation. The partnership between the East West Center and KPF extends back to 2005. And we at the center take this long-term relationship very seriously indeed and hope that our joint projects as this series will continue to grow and to reach broader and broader audiences uh, going forward. Our shift to important and meaningful virtual forums is just another example, I think, of how we can continue working constructively together to serve not only our, our constituents and fellows in the United States and, and the Republic of Korea, but others interested in this part of the world. At the heart of the East West Center mission, our emphasis has always been on the importance and values of programs that keep the public well informed on national and international issues. And certainly in the range of things that we do as an organization, the subject of fostering strong relationships between the United States and the Republic of Korea is a tremendously important to both our countries and to our allies and friends in the region. We of course also constructively engage as organizations on the topic of our relations with North Korea. And today's seminar is a case in point. We now have a new administration, U.S. administration in place, and we are all eager, I think, to hear from the experts gathered here today to hear, learn more about the current status and future prospects of ROK-U.S. relations. I want to thank you all again, and especially to the organizers and sponsors of today's activity, uh, to really sincerely thank you for your participation and support. I'm sure in the process of the next uh, minutes, we will gain valuable information and insights from our discussions. Thank you and mahalo for taking your valuable time to participate today. Well, uh, let us start in earnest. Let me introduce the moderator, uh, Ms. Yang Yong Un. Uh, she is a reporter at KBS, currently covering daily international news on KBS One TV's newsline. She finished her uh, MBA at MIT Sloan School in the U.S. and recently earned her Ph.D. degree in uh, Konguk University in Korea. She's also a winner of the 34th Cheney Female Journalist Award. So let me turn uh, the microphone over to Ms. Yang. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Well, for me, uh, the, the landscape that I see here today is very familiar because, as she mentioned, we had the two previous uh, forum, and I was here as a journalist, and every time this virtual meeting was very timely and meaningful, so I believe that this is a very precious opportunity, and it is my personal honor to be moderating this forum. As we heard many times before, today we are going to talk about about U.S. administration and its policy toward uh, the Korea-U.S. relations and North Korea, and that is why it is very important, uh, especially uh, a prospect on North Korean policy would be made here. So uh, I believe that we have prepared very well, and this uh, my greatest challenge today would be keeping the time, so uh, let me just uh, move on to introducing the panelists and discussants of today. Uh, right next to me, uh, the first speaker from Korean side, uh, we have Mr. Ko Yunju, Director General for North, Korea, North American Affairs Bureau from MOFA. Uh, he is a Deputy Director General for North uh, American Affairs, and he was also a consul at Korean Consulate General in New York. And from the U.S. side, uh, virtually connected, we have Mr. Mark Knapper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, he was here last time. And Mr. Napper served as Director for Indian Affairs, Director of uh, Japanese Affairs and Charge Affairs at U.S. Embassy in Seoul. Thank you very much for your time. And next, uh, from the Korean side, we have Mr. Hong Min. He is a member of uh, North Korean Research Division at KINU. He holds a Ph.D. degree in political science from Dongguk University and served as an advisor to the Presidential House's National Security Office. And uh, 
uh, from the U.S. side, we have uh, Ms. Jen, uh, Jenny Town, a director of Stimson's 38 North. Ms. Town served as the assistant director of the U.S. Korea Institute at SAIS and holds a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. Thank you very much. Uh, and another panelist from my uh, from Korean side, uh, we have Ms. Kim Hee-jun, Head of Foreign Affairs and Security News Division at YTN. Uh, Ms. Kim is, was a former uh, Washington correspondent of YTN and was a visiting fellow at Columbia University. Thank you for your time. And uh, panelists from the U.S. side, we have Ms. Emily Lunds, uh, senior writer at CNN International. Ms. Lunds uh, worked as a news producer at a local broadcaster in Minneapolis-St. Paul and holds an MA from the University of Southern California. Thank you very much for your time. Our last but not least, the panelists from the Korean side, Mr. Yi Yong In, director of Hangyeri Institute of Peace. Mr. Yi is a former Washington correspondent for Hangyeri newspaper and finished his doctorate program at University of North Korean Studies. And finally, the, the last but not least, uh, panelists from the U.S. side, Mr. Nick Bauman, uh, political editor at The Atlantic. Mr. Bauman worked for Huffington Post and Mother Jones and also writes for uh, Washington Monthly, Slate, and Common Wheel. Thank you very much. So with all the panelists and discussants, we will now begin, dis begin the discussion under the theme of new U.S. administration and its policy toward Korea and U.S. relations and North Korea. Today we have 90 minutes uh, for the whole forum, so we ask the speakers and panelists to speak within the allotted time. First presentation will be given by the Korean government official, Mr. Ko yun -ju, Director General for North Korean Affairs of MOFA will present on the topic of Korea-U.S. relations and its prospects. Mr. Ko, please. As uh, just, in, uh, just introduced, I'm Ko yun -ju, Director General for North, Korea, North American Affairs. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Korea Press Foundation and the East West Center for organizing this forum. Uh, today is the 49th day since the inauguration of uh, the Biden administration. So the new administration values uh, alliance and they want to resolve the uh, regional and global issues with the help of its allies. So we I'm going to see what impact the new administration is willingness and attitude is having on the Korean Peninsula issue. The Biden administration the administration that values alliance is a turning point to bring new strength to the U.S. RK alliance, and I have four reasons to back up my belief. The first is that even though the, it's been only 49 days since its inauguration, uh, strategic communication between Korea and the U.S. is taking place very frequently at all levels. There was a phone call between the two presidents and two phone calls between the foreign ministers and some phone calls between the two national security advisors from the Korean and the United States side. And also regarding the Korean Peninsula issues, there were some calls between uh, vice ministerial level. And also there were some calls on at the director levels, and uh, this communication is very frequent. In, uh, my counterpart is Mr. Mark Knapper, Deputy Assistant Secretary, and we are talking very frequently, and sometimes we even use cacao talk for communication. The second is that the issues of the U.S. Rock Alliance, maybe in the past, uh, it was dealt by uh, in a transactional fashion, but now it is dealt with, uh, dealt in a mutually beneficial and rational manner. 
So the SMA that was uh, lingering for more than one year and a half during the Trump administration, but just in like 46 days since the inauguration, we concluded we actually agreed an agreement. So the specifics will be announced soon, but I think it was possible to quickly conclude the SMA because the Moon administration and the Biden administration tried to understand each other's position and tried to solve the problem in a rational and reciprocal way. The third is that the on the common challenges of the two countries, maybe it's a regional issue or a global issue, but on these common uh, responding to common issues, the partnership between the two countries is being stronger and stronger. So, for example, the non-proliferation issue, the United States is reviewing its policy toward North Korea, and during that course, it is working closely with its ally, South Korea, to create a new strategic policy toward North Korea. The second is COVID-19 response. There were uh, mutual communications regarding this, and it is continuing, continuing even right now. So there have been like uh, vice foreign minister level talks between seven Indo-Pacific countries, including the, South Korea and the United States, and two, the two countries are actively participating in the talks. And for climate change, the United States will convene a leaders' climate summit in April, and as you all know, South Korea will host a P4G summit in May, so we are trying to connect these two summits for, to have some more com cooperation. And regarding climate change, we have established a new climate dialogue between the at the senior director level to find more ways to cooperate to fight this issue. And for democracy, recently regarding the political situation in Myanmar, South Korea and the United States have expressed concerns about Myanmar and to restore democracy in Myanmar, uh, South Korea and the United States are working with the international community to restore democracy in this country. And um, and the fourth is economy. Uh, we are actually seeing more and more technical cooperation between the two countries. Yeah, this is the fourth reason. So technical cooperation is growing, as you all know. Korea. The Korean companies account for 65% of the global memory semiconductor market and 35% of the global automotive battery market. These fields are very key technology items. So regarding cooperation in supply chain in these fields, I think there is plenty of room for cooperation between Korea and the United States. Samsung Electronics, which is investing in the U.S., it is planning to like expand its uh, investments in semiconductor field in the United States. And the U.S. Chem and SK Net Innovation, they are also expanding investments in the United States in terms of e-vehicle battery and in terms of vaccine. Novavax, an American company, invented a uh, COVID-19 vaccine, and some of the products are being produced by a South Korean company, SK Bioscience. So I'm seeing more and more technical cooperation, in, especially in particularly in vaccine area. So I can see four reasons why the uh, uh, the reason why I'm looking for a better prospect in the Korea-U.S. relationship uh, since the inauguration of the Biden administration. This attitude. Uh, uh, the Biden administration is actually expressing its willingness to restore its alliance. And I think it's bringing a new strength or new vitality to the Rockus alliance. So in conclusion, this new 
new trend, the new movement in the U.S. Rock Alliance is actually an opportunity for our diplomacy. Many experts, including uh, some right here in the meeting room and virtually connected, are pointing out some challenges for the Korean Peninsula, uh, Korean democracy. Uh, demo, uh, diplomacy, for example, achieving progress in the peace process of the Korean Peninsula. And regarding this, how can we cooperate actively with the United States administration? And my solution is I think the two countries. Uh, like taking this uh, a positive atmosphere as an opportunity, we also have to improve the relations between the United uh, between Korea and Japan as well, and the peace process on the Pen Korean Peninsula. While doing the policy review by the Biden administration, we can we are actually building up a common strategy by the two countries. And by work, closely working together, I think we can have a practical advancement uh, of the Panmunjom Declaration that we had before, and the U.S. Uh, the Korea-Japan relations by like in strengthening the trilateral relationship between South Korea and the U.S. and Japan, we will be able to find a common interest of Korea and Japan. So I think this can be a momentum to improve the Korea-Japan relations. So in this res regard, I want to say that the Biden administration values alliance and cooperation with its allies, and they want to resolve global and regional issues with the help of allies. And this is bringing new strength to the Rockets Alliance. And using this new strength, we have to develop further the alliance we have with the United States and resolve the diplomatic issues that we have at our hand. And I think this is the task that we have to work for. Thank you. Thank you very much for staying in time. And most of all, from our discussion forum last time, I understand that you have stressed that we have to really stay with, uh, in the alliance framework. Um, and I'm very thankful to hear uh, your opinions on the status quo and the challenges that we face ahead. Next, we will turn to Mr. Mark Knapper, uh, Mr. Ko's counterpart. It would be about U.S. Rock Alliance in 2021. Uh, he just mentioned that you are closely um, in connection with Mr. Ko on even Kakao Talk. Um, so we would like to hear in detail what your opinions are. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, thank you so much to the Korea Press Foundation and to the East West Center. I've participated in a number of these, uh, including uh, in person in Seoul, and uh, I certainly um, look forward to the time when we can do this again in person because it is such a valuable gathering and really a, a tremendous service that both these organizations are doing, so thank you. And uh, yes, uh, Director General Go uh, was not exaggerating. We, uh, we are in touch practically every day, uh, sometimes quite late at night, our time here in Washington, but it's, it's always for a worthy cause. And I never mind uh, getting those late night or early morning uh, phone calls or, or messages. And just um, listening to Director General Ko's presentation right now, I'm, I was <laughs> reminded this happens every time. Every time he goes before me, he always steals my remarks and uh, leaves me with very little I can talk about. Um, but I think uh, our audience should find it um, comforting uh, that what I have to say is actually very similar to what he, he has already said. Uh, just about our alliance, about where the Biden administration is uh, in terms of our, our alliance relationships and other relationships. Um, you know, we heard uh, during the uh, during the campaign for the presidency, uh, then candidate Biden uh, emphasized uh, many times uh, that as president, he would uh, take steps to strengthen our alliance relationships, to reinvigorate them, uh, to really, uh, you know, put action behind the words that our alliances are, are precious and very valuable uh, aspects of our, of our national strength. Um, and I think as we've seen uh, the last 49 days, uh, we have, as we say, we've, we've really put our money where our mouth is 
and taken great steps to strengthen uh, not just our alliance with the Republic of Korea, but but across the board with uh, with Japan, with NATO, with others uh, in the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific region. Um, but not just strengthening our alliances uh, for you know for the sake of strengthening them. I mean, there is intrinsic value in a very strong alliance. But this is about using working with our allies, leveraging our, our alliance relationships to tackle some of the world's uh, thorniest problems. Um, but, but uh, you know, and I'll get to that in a second, but really, I mean, looking at our alliance, as, as uh, DG Co said, we did have a, a vexing issue over the past uh, year and uh, many months, which was the special measures agreement, the so-called burden sharing or host nation support agreement, which remained uh, incomplete uh, for, for far too long. And in fact, um, on uh, events such as this over the last year or so, uh, Director General Ko and I would go back and forth uh, about uh, the need for our two countries. You know, someone needs to show more flexibility. We got to resolve this, et cetera. But, but I think one thing we shared was the confidence that, um, that we would get it done, that this was uh, too important an issue to, uh, to leave, uh, to leave unresolved and uh, feel very good that, um, that we, have, we have taken care of it. Uh, as he said, the details of the, the, uh, the agreement we reached the other day will be forthcoming uh, very soon. But suffice to say, I think uh, the agreement we did reach is really a reflection of our two countries' uh, commitment to strengthening our alliance. Uh, it's, a, it's a reflection of our two countries' uh, desire to, to really focus on the, the challenges and the tasks before us. Um, North Korea clearly being one of them. And so uh, underway right now uh, in the United States uh, government, we have a policy review uh, on North Korea in which we're, we're uh, putting our heads together here and, and thinking about our North Korea policy and where we, where we wanna go. Um, but really key to this, this policy review is the, um, is the consultations we're also undertaking with our allies, uh, particularly South Korea. And so uh, you know, we've, uh, we've had uh, intense conversations uh, with, with our South Korean counterparts to, to gauge their views, to hear their opinions, to, to hear and learn sort of where, what, what they would like to see, uh, what the Korean government would like to see in terms of our North Korea policy. Um, we've also talked with the, the Japanese as well uh, to, to hear their views. And so, uh, although this is a U.S. government policy review, it, it is very much informed by the views and the opinions of our of our closest allies, who have the deepest and most important stake in this this critical issue, so um, can't really talk much more about what's going on. Uh, the review is underway, and and hopefully it'll be uh, it'll be wrapped up uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but there's many other things that really this alliance, uh, this invigorated and strengthened alliance, is is poised to to take on. Um, and some of the, and some of the things are some of the, the sort of most uh, consequential issues of our time, uh, climate change being one of them. The Biden administration is fully committed to taking on this, this the threat uh, to our world of climate change. And uh, we are committed to working with our allies and other partners around the world uh, to deal with climate change. We've got uh, former Secretary of State Kerry, of course, is leading the effort here in the US government as the special presidential, uh, special presidential envoy for climate. He's already spoken, uh, with his Korean counterparts and many other counterparts around the world, but do we recognize that this is uh, something that will take a global effort, uh, and it's an effort that uh, we're counting on uh, innovative countries like South Korea uh, to help play a leading role. We're uh, very much uh, impressed and, and heartened by President Moon's commitment to go carbon-free by 2050. Uh, that's a significant uh, leadership uh, role that Korea and President Moon are taking and uh, something we value and I think Going forward, we're going to continue to work with partners like Korea on this on this issue. Uh, human rights and democracy are going to be another major issue that we and, and allies like South Korea, I think, are are, are going to take on uh, wholeheartedly. Um, very practically, just uh, you know, immediately right now, we've got the, the issue of the of the coup and the violence taking place in Burma. Uh, it's unacceptable, and we've been working with South Korea and others uh, to speak out against what's happening there. We've been very uh, you know, gladdened by the strong stance that, that the South Korean government has taken. I think as, as democracies, we have a special responsibility to speak out when we see uh, democracy and human rights being challenged anywhere in the world. Uh, for us, of course, that includes 
not just Burma, but also what's going on in, in say, China, uh, in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs and the religious and other oppression that they're, they're facing there. Uh, but it's, it's, I think, going forward with events uh, like a proposed uh, su you know, summit for democracies, other events that we really do hope to uh, take on a role, share the stage with other democracies, democracies like Korea that have, have gone through turbulent times themselves uh, as recently as the 1980s as they uh, you know, moved, moved to a more democratic and, and transparent and system. And so uh, we're going to rely on countries like Korea who've learned their, you know, learned important lessons to share those lessons around the world. And then finally, I think another challenge, of course, we're going to count on Korea and, and count on our alliance is, is fighting uh, COVID, but more broadly taking on um, global pandemics, infectious diseases, uh, everything from, from surveillance to, to you know, monitoring when and where these diseases might be popping up to, to, to dealing with uh, just, you know, halting the spread to, to work together on therapeutics, to work together on vaccines. I mean, these are all things that advanced, uh, scientifically advanced uh, countries like the United States, like South Korea, like Japan, like the EU and others, I think were specially uh, placed to, to, to take on this, this important responsibility, this important challenge. So we're definitely counting on, on, on our allies in South Korea to join us in doing this. Um, and uh, it's just, it's, a, it's really, um, it's a pleasure. Every day it's a pleasure to be able to work on this alliance, to be able to work on uh, this friendship. Um, if you like it in the world, we recognize that this is a precious asset that, uh, that the United States enjoys and certainly not one that we want to squander, take for granted, or, um, or lose sight of the importance of. So I'll, I'll leave it there and look forward to the uh, discussion going forward. Thank you. 네, 좋은 말씀 감사합니다. Thank you for your excellent presentation. If we can have these two speakers at our next forum, maybe we have to like change the reverse the order because because the two speakers always share like similar topics and similar views. So maybe we can uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Napper can take the first opportunity to talk and then uh, followed by Mr. Cope. So uh, human rights, uh, climate change, and COVID-19, and uh, democracy, like this, you said, um, Mr. Napper said the U.S.-Korea alliance can be a groundwork to resolve these global issues as well as regional issues. And the next will be from a, the Korean, uh, Korean side. Uh, Mr. Hong Min will give his presentation on the challenges on the Korea-U.S. relations. Hello, I'm Hong Min. Well, today I'm going to talk about the um, nor North Korean policy of Biden administration. It is not detailed. However, the uh, I would like to touch upon the things that uh, the new administration may consider in terms of uh, making their North Korean policy. And I would like to state that this is a uh, consensus that was uh, that was made in uh, South Korea. Well, we it's very difficult to really uh, touch upon in detail of what has happened uh, between US and DPRK, but let me just point out some. Uh, last, uh, in January, the 8th Congress of the Workers' Party of DPRK, uh, they showed a powerful army and courageous uh, strength, and they wanted to show it off to the world. And the implication of the military parade that was held there, uh, we have to look into it, uh, means that they are going to uh, act in uh, proportion, meaning that they are going to fight with power to power and goodwill to goodwill. Uh, so that was the explicit message, but if you look into it, uh, it is uh, the North Korean style disarmament uh, that they would like to propose. Uh, this this course was uh, what North Korea had emphasized very much, um, and it is uh, renewed. The emphasis was renewed, uh, and in this Eighth Congress, it was mo more of a heck, uh, nu nuclear doctrine that they declared. So the new Biden administration uh, 
making their North Korean policy. I uh, would like to say that it is very important that they understand uh, where DPRK stands in terms of this nuclear doctrine. And uh, this North Korean style uh, disarmament, how this uh, can be uh, corresponding to the disarmament that the U.S. is trying to uh, carve out. So a unilateral uh, denuclearization proposal uh, in the past, this uh, has expired and it was unsuccessful that everyone agrees, I believe. So this uh, disarmament, uh, nuclear disarmament uh, and the uh, discourse on it uh, should be a very detailed and very sophisticated and amidst all this we have to understand correctly what the DPRK is proposing uh, in terms of their style of nuclear disarmament. Second would be the inter-Korean um, relations. About inter-Korean relations, what is the attitude of the respective countries of South Korea, North Korea, and U.S.? Let me look into it. Uh, DPRK uh, wants uh, their originality in terms of uh, working with uh, U.S. and uh, to, with South Korea. However, in real, what they are uh, trying to do is uh, they look at the inter-Korean relations as a, a tool, and it's a tool for their dialogue uh, with the U.S. Uh, and depending on what they need at times, they, they shake up the inter-Korean relations and they utilize it. And they have, uh, they are maintaining the frame that the inter-Korean relations uh, should be intact and, and both sides should be devoted. So the two Koreas have their own framework in terms of looking into inter-Korean relations. However, it is very much intertwined uh, to other uh, relations such as DPRK and U.S. Uh, and U.S. also is maintaining its um, uh, it's situation that the denuclearization should happen uh, in advance. So all these frames coming into the picture, uh, we have to take into consideration that these relations are regarded as tools to some extent. Uh, what I would like to emphasize was is that if we, if all three of us look at the relationships uh, as a tool, then what would be the, the um, status uh, that the three countries uh, should take. Uh, what we have to uh, look at is the military agreement uh, that was made between the two Koreas uh, uh, two years, three years back, um, and we agreed on uh, non-provocation and confrontation. However, there were little uh, progress that was made to today. Uh, so what we need to do is maintain the attitude to uh, support denuclearization uh, efforts of North Korea. Uh, last year, uh, the Deputy Director Kim Yo-jong, uh, she had announced ver in very detail uh, their uh, urge for the withdrawal of uh, North Korean hostile policy. And in terms of withdrawal of hostile policy with, uh, towards North Korea, uh, South Korea and U.S. should uh, closely coordinate in terms of the stance that we should take in this regard. And their uh, proposal is very comprehensive. The DPRK's proposal is very comprehensive and very detailed. Uh, so we have to have a common understanding of uh, to which level we are going to correspond to their proposal. Uh, and I think we can take two uh, paths. One is uh, that they are seeing uh, their willingness to denuclearize, one, and another would be uh, that uh, being skeptical that they want to denuclearize. And the goodwill measures uh, for the DPRK, what they think is that the goodwill measure that should be uh, uh, corresponding uh, 
with U.S. and the DPRK, it should take place, and uh, they think that the U.S. had not done uh, sufficient enough uh, of corresponding measures. So we would have to take this into consideration, the stance of the DPRK. So the, to this end, the Biden administration uh, during the campaign uh, made the pledges regards to North Korea and uh, the diplomacy that the international nuclear order uh, uh, should be balanced out once again. And in this process, uh, their policy toward North Korea. Uh, we believe uh, it, it will be difficult to see a whole picture in the near future, uh, but it will be done in a gradual manner. Uh, and the proposal for disarmament will be there, but in a gradual manner. And uh, arms control and peace agreement and uh, denuclearization would be in uh, a, in a big framework of the Korean Peninsula peace regime. So we have to take all these three elements into consideration. And based on this, the three parties, North Korea, South Korea, and the U.S., uh, should have a common understanding and have uh, a big approach towards bringing peace on the peninsula. And this will be the new uh, cooperative uh, and security regime that we should see coming. Thank you. Actually, Mr. Hong, you had um, more time that you could use, but it was very brief and concise. Thank you. So the USDPRK relations, when it enters a negotiating stage, maybe uh, the inter-Korean relation can be uh, be deemed as a tool for U.S. DPRK relations, which is not good for a country, but it, it was a good chance for us to think about that perspective as well. The next, uh, from the next uh, presentation, I think we will see more challenges that we have in front of us. The next challenges, is the, uh, the next presentation uh, is about challenges of U.S. DPRK relations. This is from. Uh, Hi, thank you, and thank you to the Korea Press Foundation and the East West Center for inviting me tonight. It's really an honor to speak on this distinguished panel, and like Mark, I would also look forward to the time when we can meet in person again. Um, you know, there's really, there's no shortage of advice being given to the Biden administration about what they should do on North Korea. Everything from doubling down on maximum pressure to developing a principled diplomatic approach coupled with efforts to bolster deterrence. Um, there's also a lot of guessing about what the administration's policy will be based mainly on past statements of officials, including even Biden's own editorial that he wrote for the Korean press um, during his campaign. But little information has really been given out while the administration is going through its policy review of which a, a report from Reuters from about an hour ago indicated that it may be finishing up in the next month or so. Um, the only real messaging so far is, is really an emphasis on allied coordination, which is of course good news for Seoul and Tokyo. Um, but I thought I'd take a, a step back tonight from the speculation and recommendations. No matter what policy the Biden administration decides to pursue, there are some unique challenges that they will face this time around. So my remarks are geared more towards what has changed since Biden was vice president and what the implications of those changes are when crafting a new policy. I see three key short-term challenges that will make a more traditional, more disciplined diplomatic approach dif a difficult proposition. Um, the first is that the North Koreans have noted now on several occasions since the failure of the Hanoi summit that they have a declining belief the nature of U.S. DPRK relations can actually change. 
The past few years of disruptive diplomacy under Trump opened some new doors, and the combination of President Moon and President Trump bred an enormous amount of optimism on the Korean side of the equation that something bold, something different was possible. But after a lot of talk and a number of commitments, um, there were few actions and very few results that provided tangible benefits for the North Korean side that they could then use to justify continuing down that course. Waiting out the end of the Trump administration and staying silent about the Biden administration so far has left the door to diplomacy unlocked. However, the North Koreans do not seem particularly eager to resume talks and have essentially put the ball in the US and South Korean courts to actually open that door. Just offering the resumption of talks is not likely going to change that attitude, um, but greater efforts will be needed to prove that Biden is not Obama or Trump and that different outcomes are actually possible. Um, this may require some unilateral moves up front, much like what North Korea did at the beginning of 2018 to jumpstart that process. And this could include such small actions as greenlighting humanitarian aid and medical equipment provision to North Korea to facilitate the resumption of US NGO work and lifting the travel ban on US citizens traveling to North Korea. These would be small unilateral moves to show that the administration is action oriented and that different outcomes are actually possible. A second short-term challenge, I think, is that the North Korean negotiating team is different. In past negotiations, North Korea usually kept on a usual cast of characters, most of whom had been involved in past negotiations with the US, if not all the way back to the agreed framework, at least as part of the six-party talks. On the North Korean side, it also meant that their negotiating team was well-versed in US DPRK diplomatic history. They also knew several people on the US side and were generally pro-diplomacy, even if they were tough negotiators. However, these individuals are gone, either retired, removed, demoted, or worse. Um, and the key actors now on the North Korean side are lesser known individuals who have less legacy knowledge of US DPRK relations and less experience with Americans, less influence over Kim's decision-making on foreign policy, and appear to be harder line. So this means even if we get back to negotiations, that we should be prepared for them to be more difficult, just given the new cast of characters. The third short-term challenge is that during, di during summit diplomacy, Kim Jong-un was an active negotiator. This severely crippled the working level negotiation process as the question of North Korea's nuclear concession was reserved for Kim to address personally. Um, it is difficult to imagine that Kim will now be willing to delegate this authority back down the chain, especially with this new negotiating team to empower the working level to delve into these issues. So this will obviously pose a problem to resuming a more disciplined, more traditional negotiation approach. Although it does, although it does not, um, it does not necessarily mean that summits are the only way to deal with the nuclear issue. But it does, however, mean that the administration may have to adapt to dealing with Kim in a more creative way outside of the summit format. That could include, for instance, using the letters to Kim to exchange more substantive messages and proposals and allowing him to respond directly without the pressures and constraints of a summit and preventing both sides then from entering into a summit blindly and with the potential embarrassment of leaving once again empty handed. I think one key midterm challenge for the Biden administration will be the potential outcomes of the next South Korean presidential election what comes after President Moon, and how will that affect South Korea's approach to North Korea? If progress is made in US DPRK relations, and presumably then also in inter-Korean relations in the short term, will it be sustainable through a political transition in Seoul? It, it does seem that if inter-Korean relations improve again under the Moon administration, that the Democratic Party would of course maintain that policy. But would a conservative government do the same? how much progress would we need to be, how much progress would need to be made to make it sustainable despite whichever party won the next election. Moreover, what if 
uh, progress is not made and a more conservative president is elected, how might Seoul's policy on North Korea change? Would they really want to continue trying to improve inter-Korean relations or would they revert back to a policy closer to what we saw under Lee Myung-bak or Park Geun-hye, who were in no way ready to talk about a peace regime, peace agreement without resolving the nuclear issue first? And if that happens, would the pressure from Seoul on Washington come shift from advocating a peace regime to something more hardline. Um, that said, I think the biggest challenge the Biden administration faces is understanding that settling for the status quo means that North Korea's capabilities continue to grow unabated. We've seen the laundry list of goals North Korea has set for its WMD development over the next five years that it announced at its Eighth Party Congress, as Professor Min referred to in his remarks. They are not simply waiting to see what happens or if a deal can be reached. They are and will continue to advance their programs until agreements are actually signed. And that means every day, every month, every year, we kick the can down the road, the stronger North Korea's capabilities can grow and the higher the price will be for concessions in the future. It also means a greater threat to both the region and the region's confidence in U.S. extended deterrence, especially as North Korea's long-range missile capabilities continue to improve. So these are the problems that I think are, are worth addressing proactively now by the Biden administration, no matter how hard those efforts are going to be, rather than simply letting them grow. Um, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Jenny. So the Chorus Alliance and how we can develop this relationship was the theme of the presentations and we also cover the relation with North Korea. So first we had some rosy views but now we also recognize the cool reality that we have with North Korea. So, uh, But under this circumstance I think it's more that uh, the Chorus Alliance gets get more important in this whole situation and now we heard all four presentations prepared so we'll go into the discussion we have four panelists he here the discussion will start from the Korean side and then give the mic to the US side after hearing from all four panelists we'll ask for some opinions uh, to the speakers the panelists have uh, five minutes to make remarks so please keep uh, this time. The first uh, discussant will be Mr. Lee Yong-in, Director of Hangyeol Institute of Peace. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. I heard excellent presentations from the four speakers, all excellent remarks, so actually perfect, so I don't have any like comments to make on the presentation. So the Moon administration and Biden administration are talking about policy toward North Korea, so I want to talk about what South Korea is considering in this issue. The first is that even though it's an unofficial or unofficial story from the U.S., uh, regarding the North Korea policy, there are some uh, few flows or trends in this. The first one is to strengthen sanctions. We need more sanctions against North Korea to bring them up into the negotiating table. Of course, uh, North Korean uh, sanctions are an international framework and we cannot go against it, but through these sanctions, I think we are, we are all aware of that sanctions alone cannot bring North Korea to the negotiating table. Because sanctions over time, the North Koreans' nuclear capabilities will grow and the sanctions' effic efficacy will diminish. So uh, sanctions are a bargaining chip. So if you use this too long, then its effect will decrease. So to bring out North Korea to the negotiating table, we have to be really smart how to use this sanctions card wisely. So sanctions only. We cannot bring North Korea to the North Korean uh, negotiating table. And actually, South Korea has some concerns over the voices to strengthen sanctions. 
The second one is about strengthening deterrence. The strengthening deterrence, I believe, is just rearranging the boundary, uh, but it's just merely just re re retaining the current status. So deterrence is about national def defense and like strengthening our national military power. So to prevent North Korea from provoking some making some attacks. But since North Korea is growing its capa nuclear capacities, so are we really possible to deter North Korea? So it is hard to know. So this voice to strengthening deterrence can be a tool, but it cannot be the whole picture. Some say that North Korea is not showing any particular provocative act right now, so it's somewhat a relief or rosy sign. But I think that this is, oh, this gives us an even bigger concern because we don't know what North Korea is doing. And even in the Trump administration, when we were talking with North Korea, we could see what they were thinking, what they have in their hand, whether they're going toward denuclearization or not. We can actually read their minds, but we don't have any tool to understand what they're thinking about. So being uh, North Korea being quiet is actually a more risky to me. And in the Eighth Party Congress, North Korea talked about power to power and goodwill to goodwill. And they said they are not going to act first, move first. So we don't know what North Korea will do later on. So actually, I think this is more dangerous. And one more thing to point out is that, uh, Mr. Napper, I have a question to you. So strengthening Quad or strengthening Course Alliance, you talk about these. But these efforts are also related to China relation as well as what impact it will have on the North Korean regime. Because I understand that North Korea is looking at the U.S.-China relation in a very realistic way. And if the United States and China have some tensions, they think that they have more room for diplomacy. So the conflicts between the United States and China and resolving the North Korea issue can uh, be stuck in a dilemma. So what do you think about this and what solution do you have in this regard? This is my question to Mr. Napper. And and one more question to Mr. Napper. Uh, last year in November, the Brookings Institute, we had a virtual meeting with it. And we have whether we, uh, and you said we have to uphold the spirit of the Singapore Joint Statement. Do you still hold that belief? And Ms. Jenny Town, Director Je Jenny Town, thank you for your presentation. And I recently uh, watched your recent proposal, and I'm on, I'm on the same page as you. Uh, what I'm curious about is whether your opinions uh, will be very convincing to the people of the Biden administration. So what do you think about this? Oh, thank you. So, so the diagnosis of the current status, and as a discussion, uh, Mr. E made some questions to the speakers, please. So speakers, be aware of the questions, and later on, you will have the opportunity to make your remarks. And then next will be from the US side, which is Emily Loons, a uh, senior writer at the CNN International. Mr. Hi there. Thank you very much for your presentations. I really enjoyed listening to them. Um, I've been with CNN International for about 15 years and I've closely covered the Koreas. So I'm very excited to see the new policies that will be put forth. Um, and I look forward to getting more news from the Korean Peninsula on US airwaves and CNN International's airwaves 
in the coming years because due to the pandemic and the absolutely bonkers US presidential election, um, I feel like that part of the world has not received the focus that it should have. Um, I heard a lot of analysis and discussion about the importance of strengthening alliances and the rosy outlooks that come with a new US administration. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing more though from South Korea about what specific hurdles remain, especially those between South Korea and Japan when we're talking about strengthening the trilateral alliances. Um, we also heard about when it comes to North Korea, um, goodwill measures and how perhaps the US measures have been insufficient. Um, Jenny mentioned a few things the US could do. I'd be interested in hearing other thoughts on those. Um, and then the US North Korea policy review that's underway brings up a ton of questions. Um, we heard that, you know, for now, the North seems to be sitting back and could be waiting for the Biden administration to reach out. Um, but then there's also the very real possibility that it will launch some sort of provocation, as it has done for past new US presidents, um, whether it's going to be a missile test, a nuclear test, or nothing at all. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing the likelihood of those scenarios in your opinions, not that we have crystal balls when it comes to these things. But no matter what kind of US policy is chosen, it does bring in a lot of questions about, you know, whether we extend all of branches or threats and sanctions, will any of them have a tangible effect on getting the North to denuclearize? Um, the Biden administration has repeatedly spoke about the importance of working with South Korea and Japan on formulating a North Korea strategy. And that has to come as something of a relief, being that the Trump administration in a lot of ways did the opposite. Um, I do recall President Moon also saying that um, Biden can learn from President Trump's uh, successes and failures. The failures are well documented, but I'd be curious to know what South Korea might consider his successes, um, his unpredictability, or if there are no successes. Um, and I'd also be kind of curious to hear a little more from the South Korean perspective about how they view the Biden administration, not just the Blue House, but the public. I mean, was there kind of a sense of collective relief, like, hey, the crazy man's gone, yay? Or was there a bit of confusion? Um, you know, any reaction you can give us on that front, I would appreciate. Um, and then, I don't know if you could hit this harder, but my biggest question, I guess, is will the Biden administration send a direct signal to North Korea demonstrating a willingness to engage sooner rather than later? Because it's also been said that North Korea, some experts have said, has never been more dangerous. And that, you know, is it true that North Korea is more dangerous today than when President Trump took office? Um, policies, past policies of strategic patience and sanctions have obviously not halted the North's nuclear program. Um, and then I guess my final thoughts were whether the coronavirus pandemic has actually put something of a damper on not necessarily the North's nuclear activities, but willingness to launch a provocation. Um, so I could keep going, but I feel like I better stop there because I've put a lot out there already. Thank you. 네, 감사해요. 정말 많은 질문거리를 던져. Thank you very much. You had a lot of questions, and I think that is worth pondering upon. I don't know if we can touch upon all the questions, but let, uh, let us uh, try. In particular, your questions on uh, uh, what the Korean public is uh, thinking about the administration change in the U.S. Um, I hope to uh, seek for a good answer to that question. Uh, I believe that you're taking the questions down. Okay, let's 
ta uh, carry on with our forum. We have Ms. Kim Hee Jun, Head of Foreign Affairs and Security Division at YTN. Hello, let me take my face mask off. The, with the launch of Biden administration, it is very meaningful that all the uh, people, the think tank, the senior uh, officials of the two administrations and the media core is here uh, to discuss the policy going forward. President Biden, when, uh, in his inaugural speech, uh, he said that he would like to uh, restore the alliance. And that was very uh, conspicuous. For the last four years, during the Trump administration, uh, the alliance was very much harmed, and he wanted to reinstate the alliance. And uh, I believe that really gave a, a sigh of uh, relief to a lot of people around the world. And I believe the SMA agreement, SMA that was uh, signed, was the first good step of uh, the Rock US alliance. However, this does not uh, paint a rosy picture uh, because we have a lot of issues at hand, um, strengthening the Iraq US alliance, we have North Korean issues, a uh, uh, China, China issue, and so on. And uh, the Biden administration just uh, announced the uh, interim uh, directive on the uh, national security, and it uh, greatly dealt with the um, threat that China is posing to the world and to U.S. And it was uh, an emphasis on anti-Chinese uh, uh, line. So in, to this end, I would like to ask Mr. Knapper, uh, in March 12th, uh, uh, the Biden administration will take the Quad uh, meeting, and it shows that, uh, that the pressure on China is aggravating, and China is pushing back as well. And as we all know, the, uh, we, all, we always say that economy is uh, for China and the uh, security is with U.S. Um, so what is the Quad Plus, uh, what is the proposal of U.S. government uh, to South Korea because this anti-Chinese sentiment, it's, it could be quite a burden to the Moon administration. So, and in terms of the uh, optics in uh, Korea, uh, there could be some uh, opposition uh, towards this anti-China uh, stance. So it feels as if that the U.S. is proposing or asking us to stand by them in terms of fighting with China. So I would like to ask, uh, what's your opinion on this? U.S. and China, uh, they are not only competitors, but also uh, they are partners in terms of dealing with uh, the universal issues of climate change and so far. So the Sino-U.S. cooperation uh, and how do you strike a balance between the cooperation and competitiveness between the two countries? Another um, question is about Korea-Japan relations. Uh, in his recent address, M uh, President Moon said that uh, the uh, Korea-Japan relations is important that and that dialogue should be reinstated. However, the public and uh, Korean public is uh, quite a res resistance to this. And uh, we have a, a new ambassador, uh, Korean ambassador in Japan, and we have some issues there. Um, we have the convert women uh, agreement uh, that is very controversial in the in Korea. Uh, so I would like to know uh, your take on how the Korea Japan relations should be and what would be the stance the Biden administration would take in terms of the Korea Japan relations. Would it be more of an observance uh, role, or will, will you uh, actively engage in it? And uh, there are speculations that the Biden administration would be uh, upholding the uh, Clinton administration um, and so on. And the, the Singapore um, summit should be upheld, uh, as Mr. Knapper mentioned. Uh, however, there are still 
the rock us relations in terms of uh, North Korean policy, I believe there are some disagreements there. Uh, US is uh, more uh, on the uh, sanctions side. However, the Moon administration is more for the relief of sanctions. So there may be a discrepancy in terms of the starting line and uh, in terms of the North Korean policy. So uh, taking this into consideration, how will the North Korean policy will look like? And do you think that we are at the same starting point? Uh, so that's my question to Mr. Knapper. Uh, my question to uh, Ms. Jenny Town, I uh, agreed with a lot of uh, what you said, uh, and especially what you said on about uh, North Korea uh, throwing their ball to South Korea and US and uh, the uh, Kim Jong-un is uh, uh, observing this status and uh, they're they're not they're stopping any uh, provocations in the time being and it looks like uh, we are looking into uh, or we're, we're waiting for the message that messages that will come out from the senior officials uh, coming to Korea and you mentioned mentioned that the humanitarian aid should be made and so on. From the Korean government side, the sanctions relief that North Korea is longing for, uh, and in regards to this, the Mount Kumgang tour uh, and the Kaesong uh, industrial complex, uh, the re uh, in statement of it uh, is they, these are the topics that we are looking uh, actually looking forward to. Uh, however, uh, do, you, uh, do you think that this will be a good starting point uh, in terms of uh, reliving the complex and the Mount Kumgang tour? And uh, Kim Jong-un uh, is a belligerent, still a belligerent, uh, and there's a hawkish voice in the U.S. administration that Kim Jong-un is still a big threat in the international community and this would be a stumbling uh, block towards the North Korean policy so as a think tank how do you uh, analyze uh, such hawkish uh, perceptions for your abundant questions since we are pressed for time we will give the microphone to Mr. Nick Bauman uh, for his remarks and then we'll give the opportunity Hi, uh, thanks to all the speakers and to the East West Center and the Korea Press Foundation for inviting me. Uh, my expertise is on the American political system and American domestic politics. So I'm going to use my time to focus on how those forces could affect uh, US Korea relations. Um, Americans have this habit of turning more inwards in the midst of domestic, domestic crises, such as the COVID 19 pandemic and the resulting economic problems. And despite our country's uh, important role in world affairs, many Americans, even politically engaged citizens, know very little about the nuances of the United States' many international relationships. Uh, moreover, partisanship plays a large and growing role in shaping Americans' opinions about world affairs. It's true that former President Trump temporarily increased American voters' focus on Korean Peninsula issues, especially by meeting with Kim Jong-un and by complaining about the cost-sharing arrangements between the US and its many allies. Uh, but from my view in Washington, those effects have mostly faded. Um, so that means that absent an attention-grabbing move by North Korea, a major crisis or a dramatic change in US policy, most American voters and major media outlets are unlikely to pay significant attention to Joe Biden's policy towards the peninsula. That gives Biden uh, the State Department and the Defense Department some freedom to tackle what Mr. Knapper called some of the world's most thorny problems without worrying much about domestic political problems. But if these were easy issues to solve, they would have been solved already. Um, and major policy changes or crises in U.S.-Korean relations could draw Americans' attention back to the subject and increase the political risk to the Biden administration. Of course, as Ms. Town noted, there's a real cost to the U.S. to maintaining the status quo. That puts the Biden administration in quite a bind. The wild card here, as it often is for American presidents, is the behavior of the North Korean regime. 
in public polling, Americans consistently give North Korea one of the lowest favorability ratings that they give to any regime in the world. And American media coverage of Korean issues, especially on television, is saturated with language about danger and threat, despite the United States' overwhelming military superiority. Um, the debates about unification and Korean relationships that are so important to politics in Korea are unfamiliar to most Americans. This popular, if unnuanced, view of the situation on the peninsula creates a vulnerability for Biden. As several previous administrations have learned, a foreign policy crisis with North Korea can become a national news story in the United States and a political liability and holds the potential to create domestic political crises for American presidents, or at least distract from their domestic priorities. While former President Trump's previous outreach to the North Korean regime may limit some of the damage that certain acts by North Korea could do to Biden's agenda, it will be harder for and uh, it will be harder for those in American politics who praise Trump's attempts at de-escalation to accuse Biden of appeasement or being soft if he re reacts in a calm, measured, careful manner to any sudden moves by the North Korean regime. One thing that people on the American side of the alliance, especially people like Ms. Luns and I and the media could do to lower the risk of escalation and war is to uh, is to make sure that our readers and viewers learn more about politics and culture in Korea and make Korean views a more integral part of American debate over how the United States can best support its allies. Um, the, from the panelists, I'd love to hear more from the Korean panelists about how they view the risks, not just the U.S., but also the Republic of Korea, of allowing the status quo to continue, as Ms. Town warned. Uh, and, and Mr. Hongmin, spoke about the DPRK using the inter-Korean relationship as a tool in international affairs. I was hoping that he and Ms. Town could uh, speak about the extent to which the DPRK used the provocations to affect American politics. And I'd love to hear uh, the Korean panelists and Ms. Town's uh, assessment of how deep uh, DPRK understanding of American domestic politics is. Um, thanks again to everyone, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the, the event. 네, yes, the presentations and all the discussions are all about the policy toward North Korea. Uh, so we have a lot of questions on that. Uh, thank you for your uh, passionate discussion from the four discussions. So since we have, uh, we are pressed for time, we can give three minutes to each speaker so that we can have some time to get the questions from the floor and the audience. So the we we heard a lot of name. Uh, we heard a lot of about uh, questions to Mr. Napper. So Mr. Napper, you have three minutes to answer. Wow, that's a that's a serious challenge I've been presented here. But uh, no, I just heard a few things which I'll I'll try and you know get to very quickly. I think one is is the role of China. Uh, you know our China policy. Uh, is also uh, being looked at right now, uh, certainly as probably the most significant challenge our country faces uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in, in terms of our foreign foreign policy and uh, national security. Uh, but as, as our own, you know, Secretary Blinken said the other day, our approach to China is going to be, uh, you know, competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and assertive when it must be. And so, uh, you know, how we, how we approach uh, potential collaboration, of course, is gonna depend. Um, Certainly, uh, looking at North Korea, um, you know China's role is is undeniable. Uh, but this is something I think as we proceed with our policy review, uh, you know we're going to examine uh, the role of, of of neighbors and and others in the international community. Uh, Professor uh, Yong In asked about uh, the Singapore summit and you know this idea of the spirit of the Singapore summit. Look, that was previous administration. This new administration right now has as a review, as, as we've discussed, underway. We're going to look at all this. Everything's on the table and how, we, uh, you know, how we've approached um, North Korea over the years and over many administrations. Again, as the Secretary has said, I mean, North Korea is a tremendous challenge that has, has stumped uh, many administrations, both Democratic and Republican. And so, you know, we're going to be looking uh, at sort of how we've handled things in the past, what's worked, what hasn't, and take it from there. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much more I can say at this point on our approach to the North. Um, and, uh, just on this, on the quad someone raised, and, uh, I know it's attracting a lot of attention in Korea, this idea of a quad plus, 
Uh, we do have the Quad Summit, the virtual summit coming up on Friday, uh, about which we're very excited. But, uh, you know, the Quad, when it was uh, first stood up and today, it's, it's, it's not meant to, to be an exclusive or insular organization. I mean, it was, it was, it's an organizing principle. It's a way for four like-minded countries who share challenges to get together and focus on concrete collaboration and share challenges. Uh, some of these challenges uh, that we're going to discuss this week include uh, the world economy, include addressing COVID, include uh, uh, dealing with climate change. And certainly, uh, you know, if, if people recall that the Quad was stood up initially in 2004 to deal with the uh, December 20th uh, tsunami and the disaster in Southeast Asia and South Asia that resulted, it's grown uh, from being focused on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief now to, to much bigger regional and global issues. Um, but I think it's too early to say sort of where it's going to go from here. Um, certainly don't want to, uh, don't want to exclude or, or sort of for, for, uh, foreclose the possibility of it going in, in one or another direction. Um, but, uh, absolutely it's, it's geared towards promoting cooperation and promoting collaboration across a variety of, of shared challenges in the region. Thanks. Thank you very much. So let me give the opportunity to the Korean panelists. Uh, I believe that this is uh, the most uh, pressing issue would be the possibility of North Korean pro provocation. So my question goes to Mr. Hong Min. Right. Uh, since I have a very limited time, let me just briefly touch upon it. Uh, there is very little uh, possibility of provocation of North Korea in the near future. Uh, especially there was, uh, there's someone uh, touched upon it that uh, the COVID-19 is affecting and it's uh, damping uh, the provocation um, capacity of North Korea. Uh, they are suffering from economic downturn because of pandemic and uh, they are uh, doing a lot of uh, preventive measures um, and this is is actually uh, blocking any type of economic activities. So recently, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, was hosting a lot of a series of meetings, and most of them were focusing on the economic issues. So at this point, it is not a timing for provocation, but it is more uh, on, uh, uh, focused on the economic uh, revitalization. And uh, there is no tangible uh, results or direction of Biden administration's North Korean policy. So therefore, or it will not be uh, useful for North Korea to do any provocation in the time being. Uh, why they showed their uh, arson, uh, arsenal prowess in the parade at the 8th Party Congress is because to show off that they have the uh, nuclear or um, military power. And uh, what we have to take note from the 8th Party Congress is that their uh, message towards North uh, toward U.S. is uh, that they had a great aspiration uh, to form a new type of uh, relations with U.S. So uh, the attitude there uh, in, in a methodological uh, the purpose was the power to power and goodwill to goodwill. However, uh, on, in the basis of everything, uh, they want to have a dialogue with U.S. and they want to forge a new relations with dialogue uh, with U.S. And it seems that they have their door open to negotiation with U.S. Uh, ever more than uh, what they uh, showed during the uh, Trump administration. North Korea uh, showing their nuclear arsenal and uh, bragging their uh, nuclear capability uh, is uh, because uh, their uh, weaponry that they showed was, were all of the advanced materials, advanced weapons that uh, Russia, U.S., and China are competing for. So uh, it is a message that they uh, would like to uh, justify themselves in terms of developing such weaponry. And uh, at the same time, the disarmament and the, the regime of uh, arms control that U.S. is trying to form, uh, they would like to be a part of it in terms of sitting at the negotiation table with the U.S. And therefore, the uh, nuclear weapons advancements declaration that the NK made uh, should not be read as a provocation, but more of a strategic move from the DPRK. 네, 감사합니다.
Thank you. Actually, Mr. Yi talks about uh, talks that this is more risky because we don't know what North Korea is thinking about. So, theory in North, whenever we have this situation, we depend on your publication. So, this is uh, your turn. Great, thank you. Um, there was a lot of questions, and obviously I, I won't have a chance to get to all of them um, within this three minutes. Um, Emily, you posed the question that is North Korea more dangerous today than when it when Trump took office? And I would argue that yes, it is. And I think the, the big turning point there was in 2017 when North Korea first uh, tested its ICBMs. Um, and the fact that one, it tested an ICBM and the first test, the first flight test was successful, even if it didn't demonstrate the reentry vehicle itself, um, was leaps and bounds ahead of where I think a lot of US experts expected North Korea to be at that time. And I think it's really the first time that the US internalized North Korea as an existential threat. So the kind of threat that South Korea and Japan have been living under for decades was suddenly now an American problem also. Um, and I think that really is what created, was the impetus for a lot of the fire and fury and brinkmanship that we saw in 2017. Um, and the fact then that they showed us an even bigger one at the end of the year in 2017, I think also matters where it really just became a real problem um, for Americans, not just a problem over there. Um, will Biden send an early signal uh, to the um, to North Korea? Well, I think if they were going to send an early signal, they probably would have already done it. And I, I do think, um, you know, they run the risk of, by being silent, they run the risk of North Korea guessing what the Biden administration's policy is going to be and calculating then what they're going to do based on that guess. Um, so I think, you know, there is value if, if diplomacy is anywhere on the card, I think there's value in trying to message that early, um, even before the policy review is done, even if there aren't a lot of details there, um, that that again, that actions are possible, that different outcomes are possible, you know, that the diplomacy is on the table and that there is still an opportunity here um, to do to to negotiate. Um, and again, and that he isn't Trump and he isn't Biden, but that there's something unique about this administration um, that can bring about different results. Um, to to Hong Min's suggestion that yeah with COVID-19 with the economic downturn in North Korea and, and the hardships um, it is not useful for them to be doing provocations that would that would hurt their foreign relations um, and create even more problems for their economic situation um, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't <laughs> Uh, and so we have seen them do this in the past, too, where it didn't make a lot of sense, the moves that they made, and they were very counterproductive to any kind of um, momentum that was going on. We saw this even at the beginning of 2017 um, when uh, when there was a delegation that was supposed to come to the U.S. for track two meetings, and then suddenly there was a missile test and then the assassination of Kim Jong-nam. It just didn't make sense. So I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I do think, again, there are a lot of reasons why they maybe won't um, because, you know, I think the last thing they want is more problems. But I would also challenge the notion that they really want to get back to negotiations, especially right away, because um, you know, as much as they, as it's not useful for them to do provocations, I think the last thing that Kim Jong Un wants to do right now too, is to start another kind of high-profile negotiation with the U.S. that amounts to nothing. And so, you know, there's only so many times that Kim Jong Un can get in front of an audience and you know admit failures and you know, have tears about failures where the novelty of it wears off of not only of rather than seeing him as being accountable for his actions, but seeing him then as incompetent as a leader. And so I think, you know, right now, even if you look at the budget projections that they did for 2021 and the messaging about the economic goals, they really are trying to um, make it appropriate to the situation at hand and really dampen those expectations. And I think they're going to be very reluctant to come to the table again without some clear signals that different outcomes and more positive outcomes um, are easily attainable um, because they, they don't want to have egg on their face again anytime soon. 
So we have one panelist left. Mr. Ko, I will give you three minutes uh, as Ms. Emily Loon's questions. Uh, what is the perception of the Korean people of the administration change in the U.S.? Well, basically, the Rock U.S. Alliance, it has a long history uh, for seven decades. And therefore, it is uh, the, we have a friendly um, sentiment toward U.S. And uh, despite the change of the administration, we always had a high level of um, friendliness towards the U.S. The Biden administration, as I mentioned earlier, the alliance with their allies, uh, they said, he said that their, uh, the alliance will be reinstated. And we believe that this will be uh, a Rock U.S. Alliance reinvigorated, uh, so there's more of a high hope uh, looking at this alliance. And uh, the SMA uh, negotiations were settled in 46 days, and in this regard, we believe that this is another good signal uh, forming a new type of relationship, a, a better relation uh, between the two countries. Uh, and as a diplomat myself, I always have uh, great hope and high hopes uh, in the Rock US alliance and also, um, and at the same time, as a diplo uh, diplomat, we I always have to look at the uh, opportunities in, amidst crisis as well. And therefore, that my presentation was as such. Um, and the cooperative network should be uh, enhanced and improved. And especially between Korea and Japan, uh, the relations uh, should be uh, reinstated. And the triangular uh, alliance uh, with the three Three parties, including the U.S., should be also strengthened, and I have my hopes high uh, in this regard. So we heard from four speakers, and we only have 10 minutes left. As I announced earlier on, we will give an opportunity to ask questions to those who are here in the meeting room. So first, introduce yourself and please uh, designate uh, the respondent to, for, to your question. And, and then ask your question. Hi, I'm Jungmin Kim from MK News. My question is to Mr. Ko and Mr. Napper. Uh, Jung -yong, Jung -yong, Mr. Jung Yi Yong, at his hearing, he talked about Yongbyon nuclear facility a lot. Yongbyon facilities destructing the facilities, whether uh, relieving sanctions is enough. But even though we had the, this kind of deal, it was not uh, followed through. So this is uh, very unfortunate for us. So what do you think about that deal? And do you think this deal is still effective? Maybe a effective starting point of the deal with North Korea? This is my question. So who will start the answer? Mr. Ko? So basically, I think there is some differences between Korea and U American stances and uh, complete nuclear denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula and the peace on the peninsula is an a common issue among the neighboring countries in the region. And this denuclearization, complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula is an ultimate goal. This is a shared goal among the neighbors. But how we are going to get to that goal, we have a lot of ideas. 
I think it is the same on the U.S. side. Since the Biden administration is reviewing their policy, I think the, there may be need an interim agreement. Uh, building on that interim agreement, we have to sophisticate the agreements uh, going forward. So. Agreements cannot be made at once, so we need a step-by-step -step, uh, solution, and during the course, we may find a part that we could reach an agreement or a deal that we have talked about in Hanoi. Maybe if we have that kind of in oh, I think we actually had a chance to make that interim agreement in Hanoi, I believe. And maybe that can be a starting point, regarded as a starting point. But since the new US government is still in their policy review, and the circumstances have changed from that time and now, and we have our objective should be bringing out North Korea to the negotiating table and jumpstart the negotiation, the talks, and come up with a deal, mutually acceptable deal. This should be, actually this is a common considerations that we have to thought about when we create our policy toward North Korea. Hey, Mr. Napper, uh, before you answer, we have five minutes, so we have and we have a lot of um, people asking questions. So, to be fair, uh, you can post your qu questions online, uh, and if you can put it on uh, the chat box, uh, we will uh, try to accommodate to all of the questions. So, uh, can you please go on the chat box on YouTube, and uh, we will try to facilitate that question. Uh, Mr. Napper, can you answer the question, please? Sure, I'll do my best, but I'm, I'm afraid I'll, I'll as, as we say here, sound like a broken record. It's it's, I mean, I, I really appreciated uh, DG, Director General Coe's response, and that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of input we're, we're receiving right now in terms of, of talking with our Korean allies about uh, our policy review and about sort of, uh, South Korea's views on, on, you know, where we are and where do we want to go. And um, certainly as, as when our secretary, when, when Secretary Blinken spoke with uh, his counterpart, Foreign Minister uh, Chung Yong the other day, um, you know, the, the large feature of their phone call was how do how do we achieve uh, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? And so going forward, uh, it's the kind of uh, you know sort of wise and experienced views of our South Korean allies that we're going to uh, that's going to weigh very heavily as we examine um, what our policy uh, should be going forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question here. This is about relation with Korea and China. It's on the same similar context. So Ms. Ms. Kim Hee Jun talked about the current competition between the United States and China, the burden South Korea is feeling. So maybe Mr. Nick Bauman, can you talk about this competition between the United States and China and uh, the burden South Korea is feeling under that competition. Sure, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, as I mentioned with, with regards to American uh, Korean relations, uh, uh, the White House is operating based on what it thinks the best foreign policy is, but also based on what its assessments of uh, American voters' views on foreign policy are, and uh, in part because the previous president spent a lot of time uh, blaming things on China, all sorts of things, some fair and some not fair. Uh, Americans' opinions of China uh, on a bipartisan basis uh, are pretty low at the moment. Um, some of that's about economic competition, some of that's about um, human rights issues. Um, and uh, I, I think I think the Biden administration is probably fairly constrained on that because uh, the uh, if you take the US Senate, for example, um, both Democrats and Republicans in the United States Senate have been very critical um, of, of Chinese government policy. Um, uh, 
I think that's where I think I, I think that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. There's another question. Uh, did not designate uh, the respondent, but uh, the question is about Rock US 2 plus 2 conference. Is this finalized? It is fixed. And uh, can we look forward to the Rock US uh, summit in April? So due to the time, I think this will be the last question. Uh, can we have any answers to that? Mr. Cole? Well, the Rock US, the uh, senior summit uh, talks and dialogues, uh, we share uh, the, the sentiment that we need a dialogue despite the pandemic. Uh, so we are in discussions uh, with uh, the details in terms of when and how we're going to uh, sit down and talk. So we are looking forward to a an agreement on this. So it's under discussion, but it's too uh, premature to uh, say for sure that there will be any visits uh, from the United States officials. Thank you. So, Mr. Napper, do you have something to add on? If you have, you have your time, but if not, then you can... Nope. Okay, so go on. And there is oh, one passionate uh, audience from the floor, so we'll hear from okay. here one more question. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chang. I'm Press TV Seoul Bureau Chief. That is Iran's global TV network, broadcasting in English, a major competitor to CNN. I've been, a, I've been their Seoul Bureau Chief for nearly a decade. Before that, I was the CBS radio news correspondent here in Seoul for the US network CBS. I've also been a substitute reporter for CNN under Sun Jie, the former Seoul correspondent here for CNN. Emily Luntz's question, in my opinion, was getting to the heart of the matter, which is that the South Korean public did not particularly want Biden to become president. They wanted Trump because they are afraid of the North Koreans' nuclear weapons now. They've seen the massive power of the ICBMs and the nuclear weapons, and they liked Trump's pacifist approach to North Korea which Trump displayed at the Singapore summit in 2018 when he agreed to stop U.S.-South Korea military drills without getting anything in return. So they knew Biden would be a much tougher adversary against the North, and they supported Trump. They are disappointed that Biden is now the president. And the major thing that they are afraid of is that their fear of North Korea is going to drive the U.S. away and cause the U.S. to pull the U.S. troops out of South Korea and no longer defend the South Koreans against North Korea so that North Korea, with its nuclear super superiority, will take over the South fairly soon, maybe even within a decade or two decades. So my question to you, to allay the fears and concerns of the South Korean public, my question is coming to both Emily Lunds and Mark Knapper, how far do you think the U.S. public is willing to put up with South Korea's pacifist or conciliatory approach to North Korea where they refuse to do any kind of war with North Korea? Even if the U.S. wants to launch a preemptive strike, a military strike on North Korea to end its nuclear program, the South Koreans will never allow it. They've had the nightmare of the Korean War with so many civilians, women and children dying, uh, they don't want any war at any cost, and yet at the same time, they would like the U.S. South, the U.S. soldiers to continue to defend them here in South Korea, which obviously, is, obviously, is very expensive for the U.S. And as a U.S. citizen, I'm concerned about this matter. There is a dwindling number of Koreans, South Koreans, who support the U.S. staying here in South Korea because they are so afraid of North Korea 
the younger people don't even remember the Korean War. And uh, the only the older people support the U.S. Uh, as much as the U.S. supports South Korea, I would say. The younger people are, they don't remember the Korean War. So, you know, given that, you know, they don't appreciate the Americans and what they did during the Korean War as much as the older generation, which is now dying out and getting old, you've got dwindling supporters here in South Korea for the U.S. So what, how far will the U.S. put up with South Korea before it pulls out its U.S. troops? Will you continue to, to, to defend this country? Everyone in South Korea would like you to stay to defend this country against North Korea. Thank you. 네, 먼저 에밀리 룬스 기자님께 답변 듣도록 하겠습니다. That's a really tough one. I mean, we, you certainly have your hawks in the U.S. You had your John Bolton in the Trump administration, who probably would have loved to launch a preemptive strike on the North with the hopes of wiping out its nuclear capabilities. Um, but I don't know that the American public has a strong lean on it either way. Um, it's not something that's been at the forefront of the U.S. conversation recently. So um, I don't have a great answer for you, but I'd be really curious to see what happens. 네, 다음은 네 번째 질문께 답변 순서 드리고요. 저희가 시간이 이미 많이 지체가 돼서 가장 간략하게 답변해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Yeah, I would just note actually uh, polling in the U.S. Uh, Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Pew have both done polls. Of not just uh, you know involved Americans, people who are interested in foreign policy, but also just average Americans, asking what they think about the U.S. ROK okay alliance, what they think about this relationship, and uh, overwhelmingly high numbers for both. Overwhelmingly high numbers of American citizens and experts support the alliance, uh, support us, uh, you know, standing by our solemn obligations under the treaty to deter aggression and, God forbid, defend against aggression from the north, uh, just as. Overwhelming a majority of Americans feel good about uh, Korea, feel good about this friendship, and um, I'm fully confident that this is going to continue going forward. 감사합니다. 저희가 사실 예상은 했지만. Thank you very much. Uh, it was expected, however. Uh, this was a very uh, passionate debate uh, and the forum overall. Uh, and it is a pity that all eight of us could not be here uh, in person, but still uh, we appreciate uh, your attendance. Uh, it's, a, it's a very late time in the U.S. and very early time in Korea. Uh, and despite all this, I would like to thank all of you, uh, the participants on YouTube. I would like to thank everyone for your precious time. Uh, we would like to accommodate all the other answers later. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.